We are grateful that we can come to your house, Lord God. That we can praise you and adore you. And we can come into your presence, Lord God. As Hebrews says, Lord, we can come with confidence knowing that you hear our prayers, Lord God. And I'm sure that there are many, Father, prayers are on our hearts this morning, Lord God. So, Father, we want to commit them to you, Lord God. We pray that there would be no, Father, distractions in our heart, but you'd be the center of our service, Lord God. And, Father, we want to please you because we love you. So bring us into your presence. Bring us in that time of worship and praise and adoration, God. And may our hearts be grateful to you, Lord God. Prepare us, God, whatever you have for us today. Bless your people, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Amen. Let's start off this morning with Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, Born to Set Thy People Free. That's what we celebrate this month. Let's do it together. sins and fears release let us find our rest in thee Israel's strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation joy of every longing heart joy to those who long to see the day spring from on high appear. Come, thou promise rod of Jesse, of thy birth we long to hear. O'er the hills the angels singing news, glad tidings of a birth. Go to him praises bring Christ the Lord has come to earth come to earth to taste our sadness he whose glory knew no end by his life he brings us sadness our redeemer shepherd friend leaving without number born within a cattle star this the everlasting wonder Christ was born the Lord of all born thy people to deliver born a child and yet a king born to reign in us forever now thy gracious kingdom bring by thine all eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone by thine all sufficient merit raise in us thy glorious throne Well, good morning. Let's uh, circulate a little bit. Say hello to someone. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there's no water. Jesus said, blessed are those of you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. For you, for I will be filled. Thank you, Lord. If 
faith can move the mountains. Let the mountains move. We've come with expectation, waiting here for you. Still you know my heart, the author of salvation, you've loved me from the start, waiting here for you, with our hands.
this morning, we want to thank you for a time of praise and adoration, Lord God. We kind of get a look to have a little bit of taste of heaven, Lord, when we gather together like this and we get to sing to you, Lord. And we look forward to the day, Lord, when we'll see you face to face, heart to heart, Lord God. We'll know you as you are, Lord. But until then, we have to settle, Lord, for what you've given us through the Holy Spirit, Lord. So we pray this morning, Lord God, that you speak to us and teach us and give us knowledge and understanding of the Holy One, God. We pray your blessing on each heart that you brought here this morning, Lord, that you would touch them through the Word of God and change them, God, and strengthen them and encourage them, God. Now glorify yourself, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. We are in the book of Acts, chapter 18. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts 18, verse 18. Acts 18, verse 18. You're going to need a Bible today. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We'll let you use one of ours. Acts 18. Tell me when you're there. One person's there. <laughs> you there? Say there. There, there, there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, look at me for a second. Hold your hand there in the book of Acts. We have the honor and the blessings of being able to gather together again and to learn God's word. We probably have the greatest time in the history of mankind concerning the availability of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God. But what can happen to us in church, the body of Christ, is the same thing that happened to the Israelites when God had taken them out of the Promised Land, or taken, I'm sorry, out of Egypt and headed toward the Promised Land. It says that their hearts became hard. And the reason why their hearts became hard is they heard the word of God, but they didn't apply it to their lives. They said that sounded wonderful, but they wouldn't obey the teachings of the word of God in their own personal lives. So their hearts became hard. You and I, get to hear the Word of God, get to be taught the Word of God, and God will literally speak to you the truth. He'll change your heart and give you what you need for that day and for that week and even that month or even for a lifetime, some of these teachings. But as you've already put yourself in the place of where I've heard so much of the Word of God that it doesn't affect my heart and affect my life. Then what happens, and please listen, it makes your heart harder. And then the next time you hear the Word of God and you don't obey, it makes it harder again and harder again. So what happened to the people of God's people who was taken to the Promised Land is literally when they got to the Promised Land, They were so full of unbelief because they wouldn't apply the truth of God to their lives that they wouldn't go in the promised land and they ended up all of them dying the 40 years in the wilderness because of unbelief. What's my point? I think you already know. Please don't hear or just hear the word of God. Because if you'll receive the word of God, it'll give you everything you need. 
But if you just hear the word of God and don't apply the word of God, it's going to harden your heart. That's how it works. So let's go to the book of Acts now, chapter 18. Verse 18. Paul has been going about on the second part of his missionary journey. He's going back to churches and areas that God has called him to go back to and minister and to strengthen and to encourage. But he's going to new places too. I believe that Paul's life was probably one of the most exciting life as a Christian that there could ever be. Because he's experiencing new things. He's experienced the Spirit of God. He's experiencing people he's never met before. New opportunities. But he's going to places that you and I may think when God sends somebody to this place that everything is just rosy. And let me ask you this question before we go to the Word. What would be the perfect place that you would God want God to send you for ministry? Let's see, San Luis Obispo is a really nice place. Everybody there is educated. Everyone there has their life together. Everyone is successful, so to say. To live there, you have to have a lot of money. That's where I want to go. Please listen. People are people. And they have the same problems, maybe in just a different way, or they hide them differently, no matter where they are. God would now send Paul to this place called Corinth. It was an important city, being the capital of Achaia. But it was the most immoral city on the earth at that time. It was known for its many tavern bars and its great drunkenness. Upon all the hills overlooking the city was the temple of Aphrodite, the home to 1,000 prostitutes. And every night, these ladies would come down into the city to earn their wages for their goddess. And yet, as Paul found out, God had many people in this city. The Lord would save many in Corinth so that a few years later, Paul would write this. And this is what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor infamous, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. As such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus. And by the Spirit of God, these Corinthians, many of them were saved from what they used to be, just like you and I, and just like every single Christian. God desires to save these people, and that's why he sent Paul there. And many of them did get saved, and their lives did change. Now, Paul starts here in verse 18, and it speaks this. He says, so Paul still remained a good while in Corinth, my addition. Then he took leave of the brethren, and he sailed to Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And he had his hair cut off at Chinchira, where he had taken a vow. This morning, we want to share with you three different things, but here's the first one in our teaching. It is about taking a vow. We're not told what kind of vow Paul makes here, but it seems to be this thing called a Nazarite vow, 
And I want to share with you concerning what this really meant during Paul's time, during the Old Testament time, and what it means toward our time concerning vows. So you have to turn with me to Numbers chapter 6. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So it's in the, New, in the Old Testament, in the very first four books. So turn there with Numbers chapter 6. Tell me when you're there. There, okay. Let's read it. Verse, verse 2 says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say to them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to take a vow, a vow of the Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and he shall drink no wine or vinegar of wine, or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquid of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of wine of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husks. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head, until the days are fulfilled in which he separates himself unto the Lord, and he shall be holy, and he shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. So this is the Nazarite vow. And it appears that Paul had some point he earlier made a specific commitment to God. And now, as he's leaving Corinth, he has completed his vow, and he begins to cut his hair. So let's look at this Nazarite vow and let's dissect it. It has three parts. The first is a separation to God. It is a vow to separate yourself to a certain or from certain worldly things. To separate yourself to God for a service, for a time. This is the heart of a vow. It is always about a commitment to God. That's the key. Let me read to you this word, what it means concerning the word commitment. It is a dedication to a long-term course of action, engagement, involvement, a pledge or a promise to do something, the delivery of a person or a thing into the charge of another to entrust implies committal based on trust and confidence. So what it says here is that I'm going to commit myself to you, God, especially during these times. This is not just a commitment that lasts for a short period of time, although it does. Let me explain that. This is a special time that Paul says, I'm not going to do these things for a certain period of time because I really want to commit myself to do whatever you want me to do, God, in this instance, in this circumstance. We could say this same thing about Daniel in the book of Daniel when Daniel decides that he's going to fast and separate himself unto God for a specific time so he could hear from God. And that's what he does do. He stops eating. He only eats vegetables and he only eats bread. And that's what Daniel does. Well, this vow was a commitment to God. The second thing is abstinence. It was marked by abstinence from alcohol, even to the point of even eating anything that came from a vine, even raisins. This is a practical part of the vow, that's the part that enables a person to serve the Lord in a stronger way. The Bible doesn't condemn drinking alcohol, it condemns drunkenness. So we want to talk a little bit about this thing called alcohol. And let me tell you why. Probably the number one addiction and slavery today in America is alcohol. I know we hear a lot about the fentanyl for young people. 120,000 young people have committed suicide taking fentanyl or killed themselves, whatever it may be. But alcohol during the time of shutdown in our nation and the world went up over 50% in in purchases in America alone. So in other words, people are drinking more and being killed more by alcohol, by drinking alcohol. 
So it is a, a really serious problem. And you will think maybe, well, it doesn't affect the church. It doesn't affect any Christian. Christians don't mess with it. Don't bother that. It doesn't affect it. It does affect us in every way. Because there are many Christians who also, uh, they say in America that the problems that the world has are the same problems the church has. It's, it's no different. That's not good. I'm sorry, but it isn't good at all. We are to be separated as unto God. There is an aspect of serving the Lord in which God doesn't want us to serve under the influence of anything except his Holy Spirit. This seems to be the problem that Aaron and his two sons Nahab and Abuhu had in Leviticus 10. And the tabernacle had been set up by Moses in the wilderness and the fire had come down from God to consume the sacrifice of the altar. Nadab and Abuhu figured they needed to do something useful being priests of God. And so they rushed into God's presence with incense. But God hadn't asked them to do that so God sent fire to consume them. So he loses his two sons, Aaron does, because they are drunk, evidently, they, they believe. And they come into the presence of God drunk. Later on, God tells his dad this, Aaron, their dad did this in Leviticus 10. He says this, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generation, and that you may put difference between holy and unholy, and put between the unclean and the clean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. It is God's desire that those who serve him have a clear head. They need to be able to tell the difference between what is good and what is not. This doesn't happen when a person's head is clouded with alcohol. There is a sense in scripture in which God gives you as a Christian to have the freedom of a glass of wine with dinner, as long as it does not cause someone else to stumble. But if you want to be used greatly by God in his way, then I would encourage you to stay as far as you can from alcohol beverages. My wife and I, we have access to a lot of alcohol, not in our home. But we do not drink, we don't need alcohol. Some people say, I gotta have alcohol to relax. <laughs> really? Where does God come in on this? What is God lacking, or what are we lacking concerning God? The Bible teaches that God has given us all things unto godliness. When we accept Jesus, Jesus supplies everything. Is God not able to equip us in the sense of giving us rest and peace for our souls and sleep at night? If I go to God and I apply what the Word of God teaches me to do as a Christian, I can have peace and I can have rest. Whenever, whenever, from every circumstance and every situation. Let's look at the third one, visible commitment, long hair. The outward sign of a badge of the Nazarite was their long hair. Their point of the sign was to let others know that you were serving God. People would notice that your hair was getting longer and longer. They'd ask why you're growing your hair out. You have an opportunity to share that you have committed yourself to serving the Lord. No pride in hair, no arrogance. Samson was one of the most famous Nazarites in the Bible. His strength was in his hair. His strength was his commitment to God that the hair represented. Nowadays, long hair doesn't mean quite the same thing, but the principle is still the same. People should be able to see your commitment to the Lord. It isn't something you can hide in the closet. It isn't one of those things that just is between me and God. Now, please listen. Paul made a vow 
to separate himself unto the Lord on his missionary trip. And you and I have made a commitment to God. And I believe your commitment to God is going to be tested. I don't know if you realize it or not. Hopefully you all do. America has changed in so many ways. And they hate Christianity, and they're trying to remove all Christianity from every area of life. They're doing it different ways. They're undermining so many different things. They're trying to destroy the family that God has ordained. And it's happening before our eyes. There are people who used to stand. There are men and women for years who are in our leadership of our nation who stood for what was right because they believed what God said was right and now they are changing in their belief. They are compromising. God in his truth never wants us to compromise the truth, never. Whenever you begin to compromise the truth, you're down a slippery slope, beloved. And your commitment is going to be tested probably more than ever in your Christian walk. And are you going to stay committed to God? Or are you going to lose your commitment? God don't really care. God wants me to love those people. Amen. God does. Amen. But the Bible says, love the sinner and what? Hate the sin. Today I see God calling his people to a deeper commitment to him and his work. I also see many of you responding to that call and it's great to see. This story comes from Leadership Magazine. Listen to it. On a recent trip to Haiti, I heard a Haitian pastor illustrate to his congregation the need for a total commitment to Christ. Here's his parable. A certain man wanted to sell this house, his house, for $2,000. Another man wanted very badly to buy it, but because he was poor, he couldn't afford the full price. After much bargaining, the owner agreed to sell the house for half the original price and just one stipulation. He would retain ownership of one small nail protruding from just over the door. After several years, the original owner wanted the house back, but the, new, the old owner, or the new owner, was unwilling to sell. The first owner went out found a carcass of a dead dog and hung it from the single nail he owned. Soon the house became unlivable and the family was forced to sell the house to the owner of the nail. The Haitian pastor's conclusion, if we leave the devil with one, even one small peg in our life, he will return and hang his rotten garbage on it, make it unfit for Christian habitation. Now, let's go to verse 19. And he came to Ephesus. He left him there. But he himself entered the synagogue, and he reasoned with the Jews. So Paul, again, is wanting to share the gospel with the Jewish people that he loved. He wanted them to know the, the God that loved him and was personal. He didn't want them to die in their sin and live in bondage to the law as they lived under. He wanted them to receive the free gift by God that he had received on the road to Damascus. I want you to stop and think for a moment. 
What would your life be without Christ? Where would your hope be? Think of this. Every one of you in this room would be searching. Every one of you would be unfulfilled. Every one of you would be lost, including me. And probably, if Christ didn't intervene in your life years ago, you'd be dead today, or you'd be divorced, or you'd be an alcoholic or a drug addict, or something like that. God saved you from yourself, amen? Amen. And you know what I'm talking about. But what am I going to do with that of which God has given me, but not share it? You see, sometimes as Christians, we get this wonderful life, and we get this wonderful future. We have peace and we have love. We have purpose and meaning. We have all these things that God has given us. We know, although we see things crumbling, that we have hope. But we're not willing to share that hope anymore. Or maybe it's not as real as it used to be or it should be. Everywhere Paul went, he shared the gospel because it was real to him. And you and I as Christians have the opportunity to share with people who are hopeless. And I believe, even though We see things that are evil out there, that there are many who are searching today and are open to the gospel. I'm not saying to go like Paul, house to house, or city to city. And I don't believe that God is saying that to you. But I do believe that God is saying that you are to share the gospel with your neighbors, with friends, with your children, with your grandchildren, and never stop. Don't be a pain or a pill. (laughs) And you know what I mean by that. But don't stop sharing the truth because it is the only words that will buy the gospel, the good news. And this is what Paul did. Let's go on in verse 20 and 21. When they asked him to stay a long time with them, he did not consent. But he took leave of them, saying... I must by means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. So Paul has to leave, he believes, and he does. He will come back because God is willing. But we want to center on this thing called God's will, if God wills. The word literally means, does God have this in mind? Is it resolved or determined to purpose? Is this a desire or wish that God has? So here Paul is saying, if God wills, I'll return again. I don't know what God's will is at this point. I don't know what the Lord has in mind, but if the Lord's willing, if that's a part of God's will, I will return. Now look at me for one second, please, if you don't mind. We're going to share with you about the will of God and knowing the will of God. But in order to know the will of God, there's something that has to happen within your heart. Because we've all been at this point, because we've said this to God, you show me your will, God, and I'll do it. And many times we don't do it. And the reason why we don't do it is because our hearts are not in the place where we need to be. Our hearts need to be in the place, and God will work this in our hearts if we'll let him. That says this to God, I promise you, God, by the grace of God, by the mercy of God, and by the Spirit of God who lives in me, whatever you show me, I am willing to do that, God. I'm willing, because you'll give me the ability and the desire to do it. 
But what we can do is have hearts that are selective. If God tells me what I want him to tell me, let's go, Lord. Let's go, Lord. If not, I've already made up my mind I'm not going to do that. We can all know the will of God. It is God's desire for you to know his will. Let me share five things with you real quickly. How to know God's will. First of all, through prayer. Speaking to God and asking him to do his will. And then quietly waiting for an answer. God, is this what you want me to do? Is this what your perfect will for my life? And then quietly waiting. Here's the hard part. I'm not going to take a step. I'm not going to move an inch, God, until you tell me. I know what I want to do, God, but I'm not going to move. Let's look at the second one. Do the word of God, which all things must be tested. Lord, shall I get divorced? <laughs> well, let me think. Uh, I mean, we don't have to be very foolish. And I'm, that means I can never get divorced because I have an abusive husband or an abusive wife or a cheating husband or a cheating wife. Does that mean I can never get divorced? No, that's not what it means. There are terms in the Bible that teach us that there's legally we can get divorced. But we must marry a Christian if we decide to do that in the sense of we can biblically get divorced. So I must verify everything by the word of God. Here's what God's word says. Second, third one, through others that have walked with God who have wisdom. So in other words, I want to get information from people who have gone through life, made mistakes, know the scripture, have lived the scripture, and it's affected their lives and their hearts, and I can see them living out what God says they're to live out. They're real Christians. I want to ask them, so what, what do you think about this? Give me your experience. Give me your knowledge. The fourth one, patiently waiting on God. God will show you. He promises. And the last one, through dreams and visions, as we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, God will speak to us at times through dreams. God will show us visions. God is working in every Christian heart today to work in a desire to do his will. He works in us. He puts the desire to do what he has called us to do and even be. As he does that, through all kinds of circumstances, it may be through a heavy trial like Joseph or it may be through a gentle nudge like Mary. Listen to what Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. A couple of scriptures concerning that same thought. James 4.13-17 says this, Come now, you say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. Well, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All your such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So now I want to show you a couple of things that God is working in our hearts, and it is his perfect will. They're pretty simple, and there's scripture. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 28. Matthew 18, tell me when you're there. And this first one is God's will is that we forgive others.
You there? But the servant, verse 28, went out and found one of his fellow servants who owned him, uh, owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid his hands on him and he took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. And he would not, but he went and he cast him into prison till he should pay his debt. So when his fellow servant saw that was done, what was done, they were very sorry. And they came and they told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, and he said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I have forgiven thee all thy debt, because thou desirest me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I have pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. This man chose not to forgive even though he was forgiven so much. We all have been forgiven so much. How can we not yield to God's will and forgive others. Listen, beloved, there are a lot of miserable people out there, and it's because of unforgiveness. Are you one of them? If when you think of something that someone has done against you and it makes you angry, there is a good chance that you have not completely forgiven. Forgiveness, or forgiving others, doesn't mean you agree with them and what they did was right. What it means is I'm not going to let it affect my life and destroy my life and hurt my relationship with everyone else in my realm because of the unforgiveness. And I've seen many Christians who are bitter. And the reason is right here. It is God's will that you forgive, period, no matter what they've done. Freedom belongs to you because of it. The second one, it is God's will that we know being a follower of Jesus will at times cause pain. Even if you walk in the Spirit or in the perfect will of God. When I was a younger Christian, there are many people who were teaching and still do that God wants you to have this wonderful, perfect life on earth. If God did want us to have that, he would have made earth heaven, and he didn't. But let me read a scripture to you that tells the truth about this, and it's in 2 Corinthians 1.8. It says this, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed, became beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. That's Paul speaking there. Being a follower of Jesus is not at times an easy life, especially in the days we live. I mean, many people out there hate Christians. It's true, real Christians. Those who walk in the Spirit and whose life reflect Christ. But who they're really rejecting is Christ in you. So don't take it personal. It is God's will for us to know the faith will produce works in our lives. Listen to what James 20, or 2.20 says. How foolish can you see, can you see the faith without good works or good deeds is useless. My life is to become more like Jesus. I'm to be one who produces fruit. It's natural to produce love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. It's natural for a Christian. It's unnatural not to. That's what the Bible teaches. It is God's will that you produce fruit. Now I want you to turn with me to another place. This is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Every one of you know well, but let me tell you why you need to know this. The 
because I believe we're going to see a lot of death. It is God's will that you know that when someone loves Jesus and is a Christian and he dies or she dies, we will see them again. That is our hope. First Thessalonians 13 says this, and now dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised from to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you then this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns and not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we will all still be alive and remain on the earth and be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. You talk about hope. That overrules death. Here it is. It is God's will that a Christian marries only another Christian. 1 Corinthians 7, 39, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Only in the Lord. It is God's will that everyone responds to the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In other words, salvation to Christ. You have to turn with me to another scripture, and this will be the last one. Matthew 22, 1 to 14. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. Tell me when you're there. Man, you guys are fast. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by a parable, and he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come again. He sent out his other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted calf are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and they went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. When the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murders, and burned up the city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and so many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highway and gathered them, all whom they found both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to the, to the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come into here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to his servant, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many who are called, but few are chosen. It is God's will that every man be saved. Jesus paid the price for the sins of the world, of every person. But here's where the free choice comes in. Only that person can choose Christ that is offered to every person. And the last one, you won't know if it's the will of God at times unless you act on certain things concerning God's word. In Matthew 8, verse 1 to 3, it says this, large crowds, large crowds followed Jesus as he came down the mountainside. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy was di disappeared. Beloved, we need to take this to heart 
and then teach it to our children that we can compare everything concerning God's will by the word of God, and we can know as Christians the will of God. Now, let's go on to verse 22. And when he had landed at Caesarea, talking about Paul, and gone up and greeted the church, he went to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, the departure, and he went and over into the region of Galatia, Pergia, and in order, strengthening all of the disciples. We look at these short verses, but the distance that Paul traveled was 1,500 miles in ministry at this time, just in a few verses. Now, a certain man named Paulus, a Jewish man named Apollos, born as Alexander, an eloquent man and mighty at the scripture, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he know, knew only the baptism of John. So Paul is on his way to Jerusalem prior to his arriving. Another Jew arrives, an eloquent man, a brilliant man. He was from Alexandria. He was mighty in the scripture. That word means not only he had a good knowledge, but he was able to explain carefully the scripture. Now, he was no doubt a disciple of John the Baptist. And he wasn't, John was not a Baptist, he was one who baptized. He knew the baptism of John. What, we know about, what do we know about John's preaching? John taught uh, that he was not the Messiah, that there was one coming after me who is mightier than I am, and the latchets of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. And he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. So he knew that John was telling that the coming of the Messiah was at hand, and that the Messiah would be baptizing them in the Holy Spirit. But his basic teaching was the scripture and explaining the scriptures, and no doubt showed that the time of the Messiah was coming at hand. But there was a point where Apollos had become disconnected to the things going on in Israel. He was unaware of the crucifixion of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus. He was one, unaware of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, so his ministry was not complete. He didn't know all he should have known. But listen to what the scripture teaches about this man. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This word more accurately means exactly and more perfectly, more fulfilling, more truth. At this point, we realize that Apollos is a great man, without a doubt, and he loves God. He is a man who is mighty in the scripture. He is a man who is fervent in the spirit. He's eloquent, he's brilliant, and yet two of the people who were listening to him understood more fully the things than that he spoke himself. Or the, through Paul, they had come to know that Jesus was the Messiah and the empowering of the Holy Spirit in their personal lives. Notice something else great about Apollos, that he was willing to listen to a couple of congregation who understood more completely than did he the way of the Lord. I also admire Aquila and Priscilla for taking the eloquent man and sharing the way of the Lord with him. Notice that it doesn't say that Aquila and Priscilla, both of them, were instruments of God and explain the, that Apollos was the way of the Lord more completely. So what can we learn from this part of this story? of this man. Apollos took instruction and was teachable. I have been studying the Bible for over 40 years and there are more, I believe, there are so many more things I have to learn 
There are things that I will read in the Bible that God will remind me and I'll say, oh yeah, oh yeah. Or God will say something to me and teach me something new from a different person. There's times that Dave has said some things or Todd has said some things or different men have said things and I go, yeah, man, that makes total sense. And it puts them together. My point is, being teachable is so important that if we're not teachable, we won't learn and we won't grow. I don't care who you are. Now, I believe that one of the ingredients for teachableness is humility. That I have to be humble. If I stay humble, I can learn from anyone, even a donkey. I can learn from someone who is less educated than me, who is younger than me, or who is less successful than me. Let me read you that word, and you know I've, done, I've emphasized that before, about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, we talked about this. But humility is so important in our Christian walk, it's unbelievable. Let me read you the meaning again. Lowliness of mind, having a shown a consciousness of one's defects or short, shortcomings. Not proud, not self-assertive, modest. I like this part of the understanding of humility. It's knowing yourself and being honest with your defects and shortcomings. Now, raise your hand this morning if you are perfect. Please don't raise your hands. And neither can I raise my hand. None of us can. If we're honest with ourselves, we know we fall short. We miss the mark, every one of us. None of us are perfect. When we get to heaven, beloved, then I'll be able to look upon you and you'll be able to look upon me and say, man, that guy's finally perfect. I've seen so many flaws in him, but now I can see he's, he doesn't have any. <laughs> Let me read another part to that same word. It's knowing the old man is, how the old man is, and it is nothing to be proud of. When you're honest with yourself, it is very humbling. Now, humility doesn't just happen. I wish it did. God allows circumstances in our lives for that to happen. But the Bible teaches that, there are, that I must put on humility, literally like a garment. I noticed that Holly put on her new sweater, or a different sweater. I said, man, that looks nice and warm. She put that, that sweater on and covered herself, and, and she's nice and warm. Well, putting on humility is the same thing, no different. Listen to what it says in Colossians 3.12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy and kindness and humbleness of mind and meekness and long-suffering. So with that thought in mind, I have to ask you this question. Are you open to instruction? We need to be open to learn and to grow and to be taught from others. None of us has arrived. We need to be set, not be set in our own ways if we are willing not to grow spiritually the way God desires us to be. We will not if we are not open and teachable. Again, how teachable are you? Pride will stop you from growing. This man, Apollos, is open to learn and to grow even though he knows much of the scripture. Many years ago, I was spoken to this, I believe by Pastor Chuck Smith. He said, we are always students of the word of God, always. Just when you begin to think you know it about a certain area, and there was one time in my life I thought, I know everything about love. I've got it down. <laughs> and boy, was I ever deceived. It's funny, the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, all you have is a tip of the iceberg, my son. Boy, that was really humbling. 
if I am going to grow and you are going to grow in the knowledge of God and his wisdom, it is going to be through the teaching of the word of God. It is food for my soul. It is manna from heaven. I must eat of it and partake of it, chew it and swallow it, that I may go down to my spirit and do what only the word of God can do. Now let me give you a few scriptures with the same thing, same thought in mind, teachableness. Proverbs 14, 13 says this, take hold of my instruction. Don't let them go, guard them, for they are the key to life. Proverbs 8, 33, listen to my instruction and be wise. Don't ignore it. Proverbs 9, 9, instruct the wise and they'll be even wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. Proverbs 12, 1, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. I want to give a different translation, that same thought, same scripture. To learn you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. Proverbs 19, 27. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Different translation, same scripture. If you stop listening to instruction, my child, you will turn your back on knowledge. Proverbs 23, 12. Commit your ways or yourself to instruction. Listen carefully to the words of knowledge. And the last scripture is in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You all know well. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses us to prepare, to equip his people to do every good work. Listen to this story. And then we have one more verse and we're done. Two men were sitting in a bar watching the 11 o'clock news. A report comes on about a man threatening to jump from the 20th floor of a, a downtown building. One friend turns to his other and says, I'll bet you 10 bucks the guy doesn't jump. It's a bet, agrees his friend. A few minutes later, the man on the ledge jumps so he let loser, the loser hands him $10. I can't take your money, your friend admits. I saw him jump earlier at the six o'clock news. <laughs> Me too, says the other man, but I didn't think you'd do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Chinese proverb, tell me, I'll forget. Show me, I may remember but involve me and I will understand. And let's finish it with these last two verses. And when he had desired to cross to Acacia, this is Apollos, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, where he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scripture that Jesus is the Messiah. So I want to recap really slowly. It's just real short. God has put a desire in us to be committed to him. Let us grow in that desire as we respond to his work in us and we commit our hearts and lives to him more than ever. Number two, God wants us to know his will in your life. Are you willing whatever that is, to do God's will. God will show you his will. The third one is reminding us to be teachable, especially when it comes to the word of God. This is how we grow. Be teachable. And the last one, it is the will that, God's will, that you respond to the gift of salvation bought on Calvary. God has made a way for your sins to be forgiven you and for you to receive the Holy Spirit and to have a relationship with God himself. This is God's will. But I must respond to this by accepting Jesus as my Savior. That's where my will comes in, my choice. Will you choose him today? 
Now I'm going to end this teaching with this thought, which I began this teaching with. You can hear God's word, and your heart will get hard if you don't apply God's word more. The things that you learn today are what God speaks to us today. It is the word of God. But if you say, well, that was wonderful, I heard it, and you walk out these doors and you forget everything you heard, your heart's going to get harder. But if you say to God, I'm willing, God, to be teachable. I'm willing, God, to be committed to you, to you, God, personally. God's going to soften your heart and work in your heart. That's God's desire. Father, we want to thank you for the word of God this morning, Lord God. Thank you for the many things that, Father, you've done in this already, Lord, but you've done something in our hearts this morning, God. And Lord, as we learned in the scripture this morning, you change our desires to be your desires. So Father, make our desires stronger and stronger every day concerning your will in every area of our heart and every area of our life, Lord. And we want to thank you this morning for the many things, Lord God, that you do every day, Lord God. You put hope in us, Lord God. Thank you for that. And Lord, we ask for opportunities to share the gospel, the good news, Lord. The life that you've given us, Lord God. Father, open those doors that only you can open. And Father, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Bless your people now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.